if you've ever taken any sort of creative writing class in high school or college, if you're in college years or ever, period, you've probably learned about story structure. We're going to talk about that and how that can tie into your tabletop role-playing game. Hey fellow Game Masters, I'm Richard Aquiner, and welcome back to the RPG Daily, your daily dose of all things tabletop role-playing games, helping you build your world and master your game. And we're hitting day three of videos, which is pretty exciting. I haven't been able to do daily videos in a while, and I'm hoping to keep this going, despite knowing I'm going to be busy real soon. Story structure. What is it, why does it matter, and how can you use this in your tabletop games? The thing to understand about story is there's two major parts that make a story. One is the plot, which is defined as the actual events that take place. So in Lord of the Rings, it is. Bilbo has his birthday and then leaves the ring behind. Gandalf gives the ring to Frodo. Frodo holds onto the ring. Gandalf sends Frodo away from the Shire. Frodo runs into Merry and Pippin on the road. They end up at the Prancing Pony where they meet Aragorn. These actual events that are actual story points, those are the plot of the story. Story structure is a little more under the surface. It's kind of like the skeleton of the story. And understanding the story structure is a good way for us as game masters to make an interesting story for our players, which is why I'm just going to basically this video is touching on the structural points of a story and then you can take them and mix and match them to make up your own story how you want it because rpg games are very fluid and they're ever changing it's hard to give them the same structure that you could a movie or a book it's it's hard to give them that same sort of flow so if you understand the structural points like the bones if you know what the bones are used for you can put those into your RPG adventure and make up your story as you go along, and it makes it a little easier for you to decide what to do and when. I am not a super writing expert. I don't claim to be. I just watch a lot of movies. I grew up watching... I want to... Okay, I'm going to rephrase that. I didn't watch a whole ton of movies growing up, but I did. That's the reason I came to LA, to get into film. They're the reason I exist in a creative field. So... I like stories and that's why I'm doing these things because I want to help you make stories and story structure is a simple thing to learn and understand. So structural point number one I want to mention is exposition. This is not exactly a, a moment in a story but it's just what's used. Consider it the talking points, it's the explanations, it's the things that help portray the information to the audience if you have an audience that you might not get just from watching a picture so to speak. I like to think of these moments in role-playing games as the time when the players might be in a tavern talking to the locals, finding out more about the city around them. They might be getting some exposition from that. If they meet the king in a city, the king might give them the full exposition dump of what's been going on and why they need their help. These kind of things are exposition in my opinion. That is why I would use these in tabletop role-playing games, and that's why I put this on the list, even though it's not the most exciting thing ever. Next on this list is the inciting incident. Now in a movie or a book, it's the point that where the adventure, the hero's kind of journey turns from being the, what the hero knows as their normal life, then the inciting incident changes that and sends them on their, their quest line. That's kind of the inciting incident. Everything changes. In a tabletop role playing games, consider it the point of the adventure when the heroes decide to accept the quest from the quest giver. That's kind of how I consider it. So talking about the Lost Mine of Fandelver, if you intend to play that um, or run this, this will help. If not, it's a very little spoiler. In the very beginning of the story, the adventurers come across a cart that's been upturned and kind of ransacked. If the heroes decide to take that point and investigate that area, that's kind of the inciting incident. That is telling the adventurers, this is a turning point. This is where you should look into this. And that is that moment that the adventures decide. In other movies or something, it's usually the case where, for example, Frodo gets the ring. He has the ring that changes his life from that point forward. That's kind of the inciting incident. The next structural point I want to talk about for storytelling is the rising action. Now, if you ever, if you go Google story structure, you'll see this. It's a, it's a, it's a slope, right? That's how it will be visually represented 
as the rising action as those characters are going on their journey towards the climax of the story. That's the next one we're going to talk about. So this rising action is progress in the story, but one thing it's easy to get confused with is think of it as winning. It's easy to look at the rising action and say, oh, that's when the characters are winning. That's not always the case. It's really easy to think of the rising action as the time that the heroes are progressing towards their goal. While that is happening though, complications will have to come up. In every adventure, there are complications that keep the heroes from reaching their goal too soon or too early or too easily. And you can use this in your game as well. I'd like to consider these kind of the oh crap moments is kind of what I say for keeping it PG on the channel here. They're the oh crap moments. So the characters start their adventure, going back to Lord of the Rings for the example. Frodo and Sam and Merry and Pippin set off on their adventure and they're heading towards the Prancing Pony. But oh crap, the, the Dark Riders, oh crap I forgot the names of them. Now I feel stupid. I'm gonna. I'm looking stupid now because I can't remember the name of the Black Riders that are chasing him. Whatever. That's the oh crap moment. They escape the Black Riders. They get to the prancing pony. Oh crap! There's a guy in the corner looking at us and he's creeping us out. That's oh crap. They discover that guy is actually a good guy, Aragorn, and he's there to help them out. So they leave. They head out. They get on their adventure. Oh crap! Frodo gets stabbed by one of these Black Rider guys. That's the crap moment. So you see, it's things progress, and then, oh crap! Things progress, and then, oh crap. And that's, the rising action should be a series of progress and oh crap moments, and progress and oh crap moments. That's the rising action, and that makes up most of the story. That's like 75% of the story in terms of like movies and books and stuff is usually that rising action. In a tabletop role-playing game that can last, you know, a year or more, it can be, even more of a percentage of that, depending on how you decide to run it. Included in this rising action, I mentioned the oh crap moments. It also includes the downtime where the players kind of take a break from their adventuring, where maybe they go to a festival in a town. Maybe they go just have an evening relaxing in the tavern. Something like that could happen where it's just, they're not actively progressing their adventure, but they're just taking a pause. That's still part of the rising action of the story. The reason I, I wanna mention this and hammer this home is I fell into this myself and I'm trying to kind of break the habit of, I, I used to do this. I used to give the players an adventure and there was the goal, right? And then I would let the players achieve that goal as quick as they could with no complications whatsoever. That was just, it was like boom, bing, bomb, they were done. Easy peasy. I would not complicate things for the players. And then I started realizing, watching more movies and stuff, that that's just boring, that there's no excitement in that. So I decided to start giving some complications. And sometimes when you're running the game, and this is my mindset, I'm being honest, this is my mindset, I'll be playing a game, running the game, my players will almost accomplish their goal, and I'm like, they need a complication. Something needs to go wrong for them. It's going too easy. It's, it's going too smoothly for them, so I throw a complication in there. And sometimes it feels contrived. Sometimes you're like, I'm just doing this to make them lose. You feel that way. I, I've done that where I'm like, oh, I feel bad giving them this complication. But at the same time, I look at it and I'm like, well, if it was too easy, that wouldn't be fun. So I have to give them something, you know, I have to challenge them and make them earn it. So I'm trying to change that mindset myself to not be of the mindset, oh, oh, this is me trying to kill the players, but to change it to, this is me trying to make an interesting story. This is me trying to give some drama to the situation and make things, you know, make the players earn their adventure. And that's kind of the mindset I had to get into where now when I go to prepare a session, I look at it and I'm like, okay, this is what they're doing. How can I complicate this? How can, how can the world complicate it, I should say, not just me. So I think of things like that that make it a little more interesting, I think, for the players. I hope they think that too. I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. Next up is the climax of the story. Now, the climax is the point in time in the story where the stakes are highest, the drama is highest. This is the do or die moment. It's the peak of the mountain like this. It's, it's everything matters at the climax. This is when the heroes can win or lose and that is all they have going for them. They can't keep trying. This is it, right? Going into these, the climax of the Lord of the Rings kind of saga is 
Frodo is there and he has the ring and he's about to throw it into the Mount Doom. And that's the climax. It's then or nothing. Right. In Avengers uh, Infinity War, it's Thanos. Both times he gets the, all the gem, all the Infinity Stones and he's like about to snap. It's those kind of moments where it's like they are, it's there. It's, this is it. It's kind of the point of no return. It's that do or die moment. Think of it in that stakes. When you're making your climax moments for your tabletop role-playing games, try not to have them be like, oh, if this ends, or if the players fail, then they get a try again later. Don't think of it that way. Think of it as, if the players fail to beat this bad guy or, or accomplish their goal at this point in time, but I keep doing this, at the climax, if the players fail then, have the stakes be so big where it's like, oh, the players fail, they all die perhaps, or the world is destroyed, or something big where that just amps the stakes up, makes the players uncomfortable, makes them feel like, oh, everything is on their shoulder, because in your story, everything should be on their shoulders, because they're the heroes. That's how I see it, at least. Think of it as that way. The climax doesn't have to be at just at the end of your adventure, either. You could have smaller climaxes, for example, at the you know, for each little side quest could have a small climax where the heroes win and it's a hard-won fight. You could have those kind of moments, but I want to encourage you as you're building your campaign and running towards your big bad evil guy that you make that biggest climax the most important thing those players have ever done. Where they walk away from that and they go home to their wife and children and they tell their wife, oh, that was the happiest moment of my life was beating that bad guy. And then the wife gets mad because... What about their wedding day or all the birth of their children? That's how I want people to look at the climax is like, this is awesome. And I know I haven't done that for my players yet because we're still working through the adventures and I'm coming up with the climaxes and so on and so forth. But this gives me an idea of a little tangent I want to go on. The climax, if you watch a lot of movies, you'll notice that it's always the moment where the bad guy almost wins. Think about it like that. Look at these movies. Infinity War is one where the bad guy actually does win. Thanos accomplishes his goal, he snaps, that's over, right? Clearly that wasn't the climax of the series, but that was the climax of the Infinity War movie. In Endgame, spoiler alert if you haven't watched it, I, I feel like that's on you at this point. In Endgame, there's the moment when Thanos has all the Infinity Stones in a gauntlet again, and he's just about to snap, and it seems hopeless at that exact moment those are the times when I'm saying that is the true climax. Think about Lord of the Rings, the true moment where Sauron has won is when Frodo decides to put on the ring for himself. And I know that seems silly because it's just Frodo, he's just a little hobbit, he's a little he's a little turd hobbit, but he puts on the ring and and all is lost at that moment. Sauron has won, he's going to get his ring back. That's it, right? These are the moments that I think make a climax interesting. So, as you're building this, make your villain super strong. Make them something that the players are going to have to try to beat. That way they can have that moment where they're like, well, we almost lost. You know, oh, well, we almost all die. We almost lose everything. But, twist, they're the heroes, so of course they win somehow. But that's for your players to figure out how to do. The reason I encourage this is because as I'm watching, I have a lot more, I have some downtime at work sometimes, so I watch a movie here and there. And I see these moments, and every time you think, oh, the heroes are going to win, the villain has something that comes in and thwarts the heroes, right? They have, like, they're one step ahead of the heroes the whole time. Until the very end. And then you look at it, and you're like, well, how are they going to get out of that? And that's kind of the fun of these adventures and the movies and the books is seeing, oh, how are these heroes gonna get out of this one that the villain has put them in? And then they do it, and you're like, yeah, that's right, there's the heroes. So now I know I'm rambling again on this, but you know, really amp up your villain so they almost win, is basically what I'm trying to say. A good way to do this, and this is more just a cheat of a DM cheat sheet, a DM, cheat, uh, a DM uh, thing you can think about. You know, you, you make your evil genius plans. And then as soon as the players do something that will thwart that plan completely, then you can go back and you can look at your, your evil genius plans. You say, okay, I'm here. I want them to get this goal. How do I change my plan 
based on what the players have done, and then you can change your plan, and then the players will have to thwart him again. They'll have to keep thwarting the villain. The reason I suggest doing this is because it makes your villain seem more like an evil genius, even though it is just you, the DM, knowing everything that your players have done and being able to adjust the, the villain plans. I'll also suggest don't go putting your villain in front of the players early on. I've done that. A lot of people have done that. You put the villain in front of your players like too early in the story and they're going to want to fight. And unless you have it all planned out that your villain is going to win and you are ruthless, either the players will all die or your villain will die because 90% of the time the players encounter the villain, the big bad guy, and they just want to beat him up. And so plan for that. Probably don't give it to the players too early. Stick with the rising action to the climax. Make that climax such an epic moment. And I've seen so many cool pictures and things where that the climactic battle scene of a D&D &D game can be a whole session where you're just fighting and it's epic and you have you go all out with the minis and the terrain and you get the smoke in there and you, you can go nuts with it. After that climax though, in terms of structure comes the resolution of the story. It's where the world goes back to normal as it can. Meaning, maybe the adventurers settle down. If you're playing a game, maybe they're, you know, level 15 or 20 and they're super powerful and they're just like, well, I'm just gonna go live on a farm and finish my adventuring time. In Lord of the Rings, it's when Frodo goes back to the Shire and then he gets on the boat and goes away with Bilbo. That's the resolution of the, that story. It's so... That part, I think, in terms of role-playing games and storytelling is equally as important as everything else because it shows how the character has grown, it shows the progress that a player or a character makes with that, and then it makes it interesting. It gives like a little payoff to it. One example is I currently am playing a rogue swashbuckler in one of the games, and he started out as kind of an urchin in the city of Baldur's Gate, and he went out as an adventuring and doing his thing, and he's changed a lot over the last three and a half years that I've been playing this character. Currently, he's on a path where he's probably going to die in about four months in game time. But if he survives, his life has changed in such a way and he's seen so much and he's done so much that having him just being like, okay, I'm going to go back to Baldur's Gate and go back to being an urchin just would not be a good payoff for that character, right? So I would, maybe he would go back to Baldur's Gate and, you know, try to change the city for the better. Maybe he would go back to Baldur's Gate and adopt another urchin boy or child, an urchin child to raise up as a protege, perhaps. A rogue protege could be cool. I don't know exactly what that character will want later, but I know that the resolution of that character would have to be such that reflects everything else that they've gone through over the time. Which is why I want this. You, I want to put this in your mind early as your adventures. So, as you see your adventurers, your players' characters grow and change, you can begin planning and working to give them a resolution that they deserve, that they think would fit for their character, and just tell a great ending of the story. The ending is the last thing they're going to remember. They're going to look at that story fondly. They're going to look back later as they've finished playing, and then they think, oh. Think of all that cool stuff we've done over the years, all these cool moments, and then the last thing they'll remember is what their characters are doing now. Now that they've hung up, you know, the character sheet and they're no longer playing that character, what, where did that character's life end? And that's the resolution you got to think about. That's the story point I want you to end with. Don't half-ass that one. Don't shortchange them. Don't just say, okay, you're you're done. You go home. Give them something satisfying. Give them something interesting that they would enjoy. That's been my spiel on story structure. I did get rambly again. I'm sorry. I'm getting back into the swing of this video thing, and I feel rambly sometimes. Anyways, let me know your thoughts on story structure or other, or other plot point kind of things or story points that you would include in your game that you found useful. Let me know those in the comments below. And again, I've been Richard. Thanks for watching. If you like what you see on the channel, remember to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon to get notified when I upload new videos. You can also click over here to see more videos in this playlist, or over here to see what YouTube suggests you watch from my channel.